Sometimes they're better company. Hello, Gary. Thanks for joining us. It's snowing out there. It's snowing in here. We've got Tom Ford. Tom, thanks very much for joining us. No problem. Get rid of the snow. Let's go inside and get away from the snow. Okay. It's gone. All right. Okay. So this is kind of getting back on track, guys, with the, the players' profiles. I know we left it a little bit to talk to the likes of Chris Henry and Sean Murphy, but to be quite honest with you, I can only put up with those two guys for so much time. They get on my nerves, Tom. You know, Henry, you know, Henry's great. He's good for what he is and spells. And I know he's good because he tells me that all the time just before we just come on. Well, you can put up, put up with them longer than I can. I don't know. Terrible man. Anyway, Chris will be on again soon. We'll have some new topics. So getting back on track with the player profiles, guy. Obviously, we've got Tom on. He's going to talk about life on the tour. I don't know. Whatever you want to call it. Tom, this is your life. This is your snooker life. You know, and uh, I don't know. You're 37 years old. You've had 20 years of it. That's why you're on here. You're, you're on here to talk about that. Does it feel like 20 years? No, it feels like longer. <laughs> Oh, it's just when people start saying, oh, can you remember them back in the day? And what they don't realise, I was playing at a young age, so I rem remember all the old players. And then when people find out that I've been on tour for 20 years, they, they think, wow. Do you know what I mean? It's a long time. It is a long time. Thinking, what else could I have done in them 20 years? Yeah. I sort of had a lot more fun and done better. <laughs> Tom, I think like that too. I've wasted, I think I've wasted about uh, 15 years of my life. If I'd have started these streams 15 years ago, I'd be on Eurosport. They'd be snapping me up for 100,000 a year. You know, it's just incredible. It really is. Not Chris Henry and Sean Murphy on you, won't. No, no. Listen, listen. The reason why I bring them on, Tom, and I say this all the time, and everybody out there knows this, I, they need all the help they can get. You know, if I bring them on the streams, it develops their personalities and they've got a chance, they've got a very, very small chance of getting invaded on the television. And I'm trying to help them because they need all the help they can get, you know? Right, listen, <laughs> we're here to talk about you, okay? Now, we're going to touch on 20 years, okay? I know I, 20 years is a very, very long time in anybody's career, whether you do a job or whether you're on a snooker tour, okay? But... The thing is, let's let's have a little look at you, okay? You've you know you've you've got the Oregon event final, you've got two semi-finals, you've got the quarterfinals, you know you've won some PTCs back in the day. You know you've came through those routes, those early days when we had sort of smaller tournaments, not as many, not as many professional ranking events, you know, in in in, in that respect. But you know, I suppose we what could be said about you? I suppose we could say that. You know, like many others, you know, you've done enough to stay on the tour. You've had a career. You've had a successful career. You've done enough to get yourself into the top 32. And if you look back, you're, you're going to probably say to yourself, have I done enough? Could I have done better? We're going to touch on that too, by the way, Tom. That could be a very sensitive subject. Are but... you be getting... <laughs> <laughs> now, you're currently ranked 21 in the world. Uh, no, you're not. You're 27 in the world. Your highest ranking position was actually 21 in the world, okay? Yeah. Just in case you're not looking. And a lot of the guys out there pretend they don't know, but I think you do know because you do watch it. So that's top 32. That's good. That's good. There's a lot of guys on the tour, a lot of young guys coming in, a lot of guys watching this. They're thinking, how do I get into that top 32? What do I need to do? Well, you know, we're going to be talking to Tom about that too, guys. We're going to be having a little bit of reflection on that, you know. So, um, look, what we're going to do, Tom, we're going to go right back to the very beginning, okay? Um, I want to know where you grew up, and I want to know the early days of snooker, how you got introduced to it, and how it extended itself in, onto the tour. Well, so I think it first started, I can't really remember doing it. Um, my brother used to play with my dad at home. Remember them little tables you get with, like, the folding legs? Yes. So... Um, I was watching my brother and my dad playing on one of them. Uh, I was only three years old, and I kept asking to have a go. Uh, and like you do to all three-year-olds, no, go away, leave us alone. 
Um, in the end, they ended up getting the ump with me and just said, right, here's a cue. Have a go yourself. Um, and I just picked the cue up and I did the perfect bridge and I hit the ball. Um, and my brother said to my dad, did he teach him? Did like my dad teach me that? And he said no. And he thought my brother taught me. And I just like from sitting there watching. Um, so I can't really remember the first time I picked a cue up. So it just went from there playing at home. And uh, just sort of, like I said, I can't really remember first starting. The first memories I've got is um, going down, I think it was Willie Thorne Snooker Centre in Leicester, mm-hmm. where, um, bless him, Malcolm Thorne, sadly passed away a few years ago now. And uh, he was there and I couldn't go into anywhere to play snooker because you had to be 14 at the time, I think it was. Uh, like most working men's clubs, you've got to be 18 or whatever it is. And um, my dad took me in and spoke to Malcolm and asked him if I could play. And uh, Malcolm just gave me a cue and he's gone, well, go and hit that ball on that table. So I went up, hit the ball and obviously I was on my tiptoes and I hit the ball and Malcolm said, yeah, you're fine to come in. And I started going with my dad sort of like every Saturday and sort of gone, gone from there, really. So what, what was it like, Tom? Was it like a revelation when you came into the club, when you started going into the club and you picked up the cue? Did you just sort of like hit a few balls and think, you know what, I, I, I don't know where this is coming from. I'm a natural. I can play this game. What was it? No, you, don't, you can't think like that eight years old. Um, I was just happy to <laughs> look in the house. Um, but to be fair, I, was all, I, wasn't, I wasn't sort of outside playing football at a young age. Um, that sort of come a little bit older where I started to enjoy my football. So I was playing football on Saturdays, like at sort of like youth level. And what do I do? Do I want to play football or do I want to play snooker? I've got to start making the de- decision here because I was starting to have tournaments on Saturdays and Sundays. So I then decided that, you know, what it was a bit cold out there, a big wimp. Uh, I just preferred to go into the club and knock a few balls about and it started getting a little bit more serious from maybe the age of 11, 12. And the first 100? It... Sorry? When was the first 100 break? When did you realise, you know what, I'm punching a few balls in here? Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if my dad would be able to ask me that because I made it against my dad. And I'll never forget, I was on 99 and uh, all the colours left on. I've gone for a long yellow, missed it and fluked it. So I actually fluked my first hundred. So <laughs> I think I was about... <laughs> <laughs> oh, great story. That's fantastic. I'll tell you what, uh, yeah, oh, you would never forget that, would you? <laughs> no, but I just can't remember what age. I think, like I said, it might have been about 10, 11. I'm not sure. 10, 11. Right, so here we have, we have this wee 11-year-old lad playing in a club. So that's that's let's go through the stage from eleven till it started to get very serious. Um, it's hard to remember that far back. I can't remember what I did last week. To be fair, so when you're going back that far, um, I just started playing tournaments at, at Willie Thorns because uh, Malcolm had tournaments every single week there. I think all the snooker players that are sort of over the age of thirty will remember. Malcolm Thorne and like all the tournaments he used to have. He used to have programs there, like junior tournaments, handicap events. And I just started going in handicap events to start with. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's it was all levels. You had pros at Willie Thorne's that were playing in it. And you had people that travelled. Um, and they were just a handicap. So it went from there and we had tournaments every weekend. And then I started going into the junior events because Malcolm started putting in junior events on for people because it was so big at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's the same as Selby. So me and Mark grew up together and uh, we were both very lucky that every week we had a junior event on and there must have been 30 or 40 players that could actually go there and win that event. Whereas now if you'd be lucky if you got 30 juniors in an event. Okay. Um, so we were just lucky from the age of, say, 11, 12, that we could play in them events. Mm-hmm. And it just that's where it started to get a bit more serious, when the competitive started. So, what, I mean, you, you, know, just, 
the junior days there, just touching on the, the junior days there when you were practicing with Mark, Tom, was Mark, was he pretty tasty then? Um, I think Mark will agree and he was good, but obviously nowhere near as good he is now. Um, but there was, there was a lot better juniors than me and Mark. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just that even even say himself, there's some, there were some top juniors about, but any, I don't know what happened. Any significant names you can drop in there on the junior scene at uh, that time here on the stage? There, there was definitely a, a good few. There was a like called Craig Taylor that was very good. Um, Luke Fisher, he was good. Um, Lee Spick, unfortunately, he passed away as well. He was a good player. Mm -hmm. Then obviously Murphy was there as well. But um, the name that sort of sticks in my head was Craig Taylor. He was really good. But he just, I don't know, he just didn't seem to do it on the match tables as much. I don't know. I don't think he ever turned pro, but mm -hmm. I think he missed out a couple of times, uh, just like in final matches. But I don't think he plays anymore. But yeah, he was good as a junior. And that's a that's a very interesting point there, actually, Tom. When you when you sort of reflect on the guys you remember, you obviously remember Craig Taylor. Nothing, perhaps, maybe nothing came off Craig in the professional game, but you remember those names from the past. And, uh, you know, that, that's very often the case, you know, where you get a lot of great club players who are, are in their comfort zones in the clubs, but when it comes to very, very tough competitive snooker at a very young age, when it Sorry. comes to serious competition, Sorry. they just can't they just can't cut it. Sorry, somebody just tried to ring me there and it's gone to come through and I didn't hear anything you said. No, that's okay. no I was just saying there, you know, you were reflecting on Craig. You know, you remember Craig Taylor. Uh, nothing, nothing much came of Craig, but you, you, you kind of, you kind of reflect on players like Craig, and uh, you know maybe Craig didn't do anything in his snooker career, didn't turn professional. You will remember all other old friends from the club that were very, very good club players, but it never extended itself to winning competitions, and that's the difference. The difference between there's good players who can play well in competitions and extend their th themselves to the professional game. And it's it's just something I think that's it's significant to mention. Yeah, I mean it was a, uh, I mean it's completely different. You go back, say, twenty years ago, there was a uh, you could go in a snooker club and you'd most likely there could be a handful of pros and there could be mm. ten players in there that could make centuries all day long, mm -hmm. and they were as good club players. If they can make a century, their class is a good club player. Doesn't mean they're good enough to be a pro because it was a different standard. They're playing on club tables all the time. But the only trouble is at amateur level as well, there were so many tournaments for amateur levels and there was decent money in them as well. Whereas it, mm -hmm. now it's, uh, if you're not pro, you're not earning anything. And let's face it, I reckon half at all as pro don't earn anything anyway. Absolutely. Um, but totally. if you go from upwards, then people might think, oh, they've won 40 grand in one year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds great, but... I don't know what's minimum wage. So it's say fifteen thousand. So they've won forty thousand pound, but they've most likely had twenty thousand go out as expenses. Exactly. They're only on thousand pound a year. Um, but luckily enough, I think the lads that are on the tour are sort of young lads and they still live at home, so they've not got loads going out. Whereas it's difficult for the lads getting on. Absolutely, and we're going to touch on that a wee bit later. Uh, 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 reflection on the amateur game, Tom, and, and your views on the, the young guys who are coming through, you know. So that's that's just take a wee step back here, Tom. That's 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 have a look at you, uh, when you're sort of around that I don't know, probably 15, 16, 17 mark, two years getting on the tour because you got on the tour when you were 19. So just talk me through a couple of years prior to that, Tom, to getting on the tour. How did you how did you extend yourself from this maybe 16, 17, 18 year old to actually getting on a professional tour? Well, I actually got on when I was sixteen. Um, okay. Yeah, I got on when I was sixteen, um, right. and then I got on the tour. Some there was one. there was one hundred and twenty eight players at the time. Yep. I got onto the tour, and they cut the tour down from one hundred and twenty eight to ninety six. Okay. Uh, but, and I only had one year to try and stay on. That's right. So in your car. It, it, yeah. And then I think it was, 
I think oh, before I was 19. I think because I only had one year off the tour mm-hmm. and then I got on again and then stayed on. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I think I was about, I think I'd have been 17 when I got back on the tour because I think it was like 2000 or something. But um, it was tough. It was, um, I mean, I, my mum and dad was helping me out a lot, a lot financially as well. Mm-hmm. And then um, when I got on the tour, I even I was working in the summers anyway, uh, trying to get a bit of money in the summer so I could try and pay for things myself because I never wanted my mum and dad to pay for everything. Um, whereas I hate seeing it now. You get the kids of today, they don't mind going to a tournament, going to have a drink, letting the mum and dad pay for everything. I think it's just not on. Um, so every summer I went to work when there was no tournaments on. And then even when I was pro, I was still working at O'Reilly's club. Okay. Um, just trying to pay my own way and just trying to do it myself, really. Um, and when you are working, you do soon realise you don't want to do that forever. You don't want to be like pouring somebody a pint or going to clean up a spilt glass. Mm-hmm. All you want to be doing is on that table, potting balls and doing what you like doing. So in that years, it was tough. Mm-hmm to sort of get on the tour and keep going and of course it's a lot different these days tom from the time you know you obviously got on the tour when you were 16 you got on the tour and, and extended there wasn't there wasn't a, a massive amount of tournaments there wasn't as many opportunities perhaps as there is at the moment with young guys on yeah. the tour, how do you compare the two yeah well we had six of when our first time bro we had six events of the year so um and i mean anybody goes down the club you go down the club and you practice against club players. Then go and give a pro a best of seven or a best of nine. It's completely different. And that's what I experienced when I was 16. Mm-hmm. I've come on the tour thinking, oh, do you know what? I'll just pop my way out of trouble. And when you're playing against the pros, you don't get to see a ball to pot. Mm-hmm. And uh, you learn very, very quickly. And if you don't learn, then you won't, you won't go anywhere. But... Um, it's different now. We have so many tournaments that the youngsters can get into them that if they have a bad couple of events, they can come back and have another go. Whereas back then, you had six events, you lose, you lose your first two matches, and you're thinking, well, I'm off the tour already. Mm-hmm. So it was tough. It was really tough. And I think, you know, a lot of the guys, a lot of the, a lot of the new professionals, Tom, you know, because of our current format, need to sort of like, listen, watch this kind of, of profile and... and and think about what was available back in your day, you know, when you were 17, 16, 17, and what they have available now. I mean, some of these kids are, all right, they're, they're, they're kind of way pushed in at the deep end where they've got that 128 draw where they could draw Tom. It doesn't matter who they draw. They may get lucky and draw one of their colleagues who just got on the tour, or they may be unlucky and draw Tom Ford or Mark Selby and think, oh, Christ, Top thirty-two player, oh great! This is this is marvelous, you know. Just by luck, you know. So back then, it was much tougher. It was less events, but as it stands at the moment, we got one hundred and twenty-eight professional players. What is your perspective on the current situation with, with with the new tour professionals and who they're going to get in the format of the first round draw? Um. Well, I think it's the one. I think it's the ones that will listen that will do something. I mean, let's face it. I mean, most of the kids now, you tell them something, they know better because the internet says it. Mm-hmm. Um, but the ones that actually to, do take note and do listen, they will be the ones that do well. Mm-hmm. I mean, we didn't really have the internet and we didn't learn from that years ago. We learned from our own mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, I just don't think that's happening with the youngsters at the minute. They lose and they go off to the internet, do something else. Whereas, we had to dwell on it and uh it was tough back then but i think with the system at the minute with it's it's hard for the young players to get on because the way it is that the top 64 play the bottom 64 and they're always going to be playing a good player first match whereas i think the tiered system was what they did before whereas the top 16 had starting like a later stage then the 32 then the 48 so it went in 16s that way, the, the young kids that do get on, they're going to be playing somebody who's got on the tour with them. So that way, it's like they can learn the trade still as a pro and still stay on the tour and still earn money. 
Whereas now they're going to be playing top players all the time. They're not going to win many. And they're going to be financially out of pocket. They're going to be too many scars. And they just won't want to come back. Mm-hmm. So I think that is what's actually killing the sport a little bit. Now, Tom, you, you came in at a young age, okay? There's there's not a lot of players actually came in at 16. There's not a massive amount of young players that, that got on the tour, professional tour at 16. Now, we have seen a few that have come in, you know, the likes of Jamie Wilson uh, uh, last year that's come in, you know, and he's, he's very talented. A lot of these kids are very, very talented, you know, they maybe maybe they need need to mature a little bit and and need to have that match experience and to to, to find the areas where they're going wrong. Do you, do you think that they're coming in too young? Do you think you came in a bit too young? And do you think that players can come on the tour too young? Um, no, not really. Um, because if you've got the game to be on, then why should you be held back? Um, and plus, if he's got Somebody comes on like Jamie. Is he 16, is he? I think he's just turned 17. Yeah, he's... Yeah. 17. Um, well, he's a man, really, isn't he? He's 17. He's not a kid anymore. Um, I mean, there's one thing I hate about people saying, oh, the up-and-coming players and sort of 24, 25. Not up and, that's not up-and-coming. It's a fully grown man. Up-and-coming players to me are like 13, 14. Mm-hmm. Um they're still the kids that are coming up. Whereas Jamie's obviously good enough to be on the tour. Um, and if his game's good enough, then why not let him go on the tour? And yes, he might he may struggle for a couple of years, but what's the point in struggling in a couple of years when he's, say, 23, 24? He might as well have the struggle now to then bounce back and then he can come back stronger maybe in a couple of years. Do you know, Tom, I'm totally with you on that one. You know, I know young Jamie very well. I know his father. He he played he played in my pro arms. He still does. And uh, really, what you said, just to, to re what you said there, he's got nothing to lose. He's he's got everything to gain. And as you say, you know, if he comes on the tour, cold, nerves, young, and thinking, wow, Jesus, I've got on the tour. I've got so much to do. He has absolutely nothing to lose. He's fully grown. He can, all he's going to gain is experience from playing the very best that he's done that. And you're absolutely right. He has got absolutely nothing to lose, to lose at all, uh, and everything to gain by that. So totally agree with you on that one. Just going on back a little, uh, a little bit again, Tom. You know, in your sort of early career, I mean, um, who inspired you? By the way, as uh, I mean, obviously when you got on the tour. You know, you're a confident young buck. You, you were going out there to do the best you can, win as many matches as you can. So tell me, who was inspiring you then? And, and who is it, was there anybody significant that was coaching you then? No, um, I've never had a coach. Uh, I've, uh, I was, like I said, I was lucky playing at Woody Thorn. I had a, a lot of players in there that was good players. Um, I think at the time there was... I think there might have been four or five professionals that played in that club. I think you had uh, Stefan Mazarosis. He was a professional in the mm-hmm. club. You had Eddie Manning. He was in the club. Joe Joggia. Um, then there was a couple of other pros. There was Richard Moore, Steve Cook. And then um, Willie was still playing. So there's six players already. And then another one, Darren Clark. So there were seven pros. Seven pros in the same place. And then we had, you must have had 10 good club players like I said earlier which could all make 100 mm-hmm. and um, it was just going in the club picking the balls out every day for these people and then getting into matches and thinking do you know what I want to be one of them I want to be getting somebody else to pick the balls out for me mm-hmm. and um, then obviously getting a few quid in your pocket as well obviously that helps um, but no I didn't it's like looking at the TV I didn't have anybody to inspire me everyone said like oh watching Hendry watching like Ronnie now and I couldn't be bothered to be honest I thought the game were boring to watch <laughs> <laughs> so do I that's why I don't watch it I used to sit down for four hours to watch a game of snooker 
No, it's just not for me at all. Well, who was your practice partner, Tom, when you just got on the tour? Who were you practicing with first couple of years on the tour? Um, don't really know, to be fair, because I think if you ask a lot of the players, then... Well, you practicing not. with Mark because you, you, your early days, you, you did practice with Mark, you did play with him. Were you, yeah. were you, were you sort of practicing with Mark back in those days, those first couple of years on the tour? Not really. Um, if, if you ask Mark the same question, he'd just laugh and say, what do you mean, Tom, practicing? Um, <laughs> but, um, you were lazy. You were a lazy snooker player, oh. weren't you? You were. Yeah, somebody mean? else. I'm not going to drop any names here, by the way, Tom, okay? But I was told you were lazy. You were lazy SOB when it came to practicing. Is that true? Is that true? What, what do you mean, were? Still am. <laughs> <laughs> It's, uh, it's really I've got a unit now that I, I practice from, and there's a big sofa area with a TV. I can put Sky Sports News on. So just hopefully my wife don't see this, but she knows. I think she knows deep down. I go down there, go practice for ten minutes, and just put Sky Sports News on. I'm terrible. But, um, I do one line up, and that's it. I'm bored. So I'm, I'm not the best. Supposed to inspire the young guys. You've just destroyed them. Just one sentence. It's <laughs> What's wrong? It just, it just shows them, doesn't it? If you practice, you'll get further than I will. You know. Anyway, look, let's let's stick around the same area, okay? You got yourself on a tour, okay? All right. You're trying to win your yeah. matches. You're trying to get yourself up there with the big big guys, you know. So you're traveling to the venues. You've got the nerves. Let's talk about your nerves, traveling venues. You know, getting yourself ready for the tournaments. How did you? How did you do that back in those early days? Or were you still just lazy? I was, no, I was, um, before I was 18, well, I think it was 17 when I first passed my driving test. And uh, I was having to get my mum to take me around everywhere because I didn't like my dad watching me. Um, it's the only trouble is I didn't like my dad watching. I think most people don't like the parents watching or whatever, but no. <laughs> my dad, obviously I, I know now why he was saying it, but I would, um, I'd play a shot, I'd get beat. And uh, on the way home, he'd say to me, he's gone, you know when you played that red into the corner, why didn't you play one in the middle? And I know he wasn't having a go at me because my dad can't make 30. But um, he just wanted to learn himself so he could try and do it. So I know that he was just trying to learn himself. But when, as a kid, when you're hearing, why did you play this and not this one, you instantly take it as he's having a go at you, which he wasn't. And um, so my mum was taking me around everywhere before I was driving. And yeah, it was good going to tournaments, but obviously it got a lot better when I got in the car myself and I could go to my own events. And that's when it's I started to feel like, yeah, do you know what? I'm starting to become a snooker player and I'm starting to go on my own and do a few bits. So that's when I started to enjoy it more, when I started going out on my own. Do you know what, Tom? That's that has a reflection on what's happening these days because I speak to a lot of young professionals, as you probably know, and uh, and the guys that play in my tournaments. And do you know what? Uh, see their families; they're not doing them any good. They're really not. They're they're putting so much pressure on them that uh, it actually distracts them from what they're trying to do. So uh, fundamentally, you're absolutely right. You know, young. I think young, particularly young snooker players. Need a wee bit of breathing space, you know what I mean? They need a little bit of time to reflect on themselves and do their own thing. Very, yeah. very important point there, actually. The very, is, a lot of the youngsters now, they're, they're happy just their mum and dad taking them around and yeah. just paying for everything. Whereas if they have to get a car, they've got to pay for it themselves. So they don't want to do that. And that's just something that I've all, it's always been in me at 16 years old. Yeah. Got myself a scooter. So I could get to the club and back and go anywhere. So I didn't have to rely on anyone all the time. And I think that's just a big thing. If you don't have to rely on people, that's you can go out and do it on your own. Then all of a sudden you you can enjoy it more instead of having people with you all the time. You can pick and choose who you have with you then. I'll tell you what. I hope I hope the young guys are actually you know when they play this back, Tom, on YouTube when it when it gets uploaded, they can listen to this and actually. 
you know, take in what we're saying here because it, it makes a lot of sense. It's and hard. It's hard for me to tell my mum that yeah. listen, mum, now driving and yeah. you know what I'm going to be home. I, um, because she used to love it. She's go to the tournaments and love watching me play and um obviously she never used to like it when i lost because people will tell you i wasn't uh my attitude wasn't very good it's still not very good now but it was terrible back then no, it's awful i've seen so, you i've seen you with a few drinks in you you're an absolute nightmare if up in, in what sorry <laughs> <laughs> if i've got a few drinks then i'm all right i've calm down no, you're listen. You're a great kid. You're loads of fun, but uh, you know, yes, no. It's, it's actually quite nice, you know, time to reflect on the early days because sometimes you need to do that to, to sort of see where you are. You know, and we're talking about we're talking about the young professionals getting on the tour and the the, the kind of things that they need to, to look at and reflect on. And you know, family pressure can be sometimes an abundance, a wee bit too much. And so that's why I always advise the families to sort of like take a step back and let the lads have a bit of breathing space and let them make their own decisions. And if they get a driving license and they want to make their own way to the events, then they should do that because yeah, all that does is create a lot of positivity, you know, yeah. and it helps them psychologically, Tom. It helps them psychologically. And that, that's even going back to your day when you first got on the tour, you know. But... Anyway, look, listen, I want to get back to the early days on a tour. I'm not going to dwell on this because I, I've got the feeling that me and you could probably talk for two hours and I'm, I want to try and move it forward a wee bit, okay? So, look, but, listen, okay. you get yourself on the tour, okay? So let's, yeah. talk about, let's talk about when you started winning some matches, the turning point here, when you started realizing, you know what, I'm, I'm actually beating good players here. And I'm climbing up the ladder. I'm actually, I know I'm going to get somewhere. So let's talk about that turning point when you started winning your matches. How did you prepare yourself? And, and what was the feeling? And when did you know things were going right? I'm the worst person to talk to. Um, because I've not got to the point where I think, you know what, I'm winning matches here. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I've just plodded on, carried on. Um, just trying to put a bit of hard work in, in some patches of my life. Um, but it's just, I think, uh, I've been around a few clubs in the past, um, never sort of settled, and uh, I settled into I think it was Club 147 at the time. I settled in there, and that's when I started playing a little bit better and I started winning a few more matches. But then things happened, and I, I left that club, and now I've I went to another club after that for a couple of years and that closed down and now I've got a unit and I feel a lot more settled, but that's now. Um, and like I say, I've never felt settled, even at the age of, say, from 17 to 22 to 30, I've never felt as settled as I am now. And I feel that I'm putting in a little bit more work than I used to. And I feel like I'm actually playing a little bit better now than, than I was back then um so i've never actually had that feeling where i think Do you know what yeah i'm winning a few matches now I, I could push on um it's only now that i'm sort of starting to think it hopefully it's just not too late but you know tom getting those wins you know s starting to get those wins that you needed to get to sort of take yourself up the rankings you know have a little reflection on that did that getting how important were getting those first wins and then just gradually claiming the rankings. Is that is that very important? Do you need to get those wins? How important is that? And what does it do? Well, don't talk to me about men mentally because I am the worst person ever to you're talk not, to. You're not. You think you think you're not, but you actually are. Go on. But um, I just remember winning, losing matches like five threes, five fours all the time. But then uh, I just started to then turn things around and start winning on 5-4 mm -hmm. and it does it's you keep getting beat all the time and then people say oh you lost again 5-4 it starts to get into your head um i mean it could be anything somebody could say to you oh you've uh you're not very good in deciders and then as soon as you get into a decider you're thinking oh not very good at deciders so 
as soon as you need to start winning them, you think, do you know what? That's a load of rubbish. And you can t- try and turn things from, around from there. Mm-hmm. Never really had that point where I think, do you know what? I'm winning matches here. I'm progressing. I'm getting better. And I've never actually thought that. I've just got on with it. Well, that's what I'm trying to get out of you here, Tom, to help you know the guys at home here. And the, and the young guys on the tour. Uh, I, I know it's hard, but it's not hard because it's a very, very natural thing to talk about it. So, you you know, you you might, you might probably re- reflect on the times where you, I keep losing 5-3. Five, five, why is it always 5-3? Why is it always 5? Why can't I come back? You know, and why, why can I not win my matches? But the thing is, at what point did you realize it was it didn't really matter and that you had to play your best ability to come back snooker is one of those games where you can come back from being behind yeah um i learned a lesson when i was i think it was 19. um i went over to malta um i played there played there for a couple of years i think mm. and it was one year i went i ended up getting to the quarters um i think i played tony drago over there and that was hard because it was, uh, I remember playing him on the main table, never really played on the main table before. And I'm playing my shot and I can hear people in the crowd going, miss, miss. And I'm thinking, I'm on my shot here. So I've ended up playing Tony and I've ended up winning that match 5-4. And uh, from there, I've ended up beating an old player called Chris Small. Mm. Um, unfortunately, he had to retire because of like, bad back or neck problems, I think. And then I beat Ken beat Doherty and I played well against him and I'm thinking do you know what I've got a chance here but then I bumped into Hendry and that was the end of that um I mean that <laughs> one as well he made three back-to-back centuries against me in the 90 and 80 so um I've had a knock of wind out here wouldn't it yeah that that's when I thought oh do you know what I'm winning a few matches here but then I bumped into him and I got put back down to earth again when you sort of go away and you think yeah do you know what I've got to improve it but um it's difficult one to sort of you'll know when you get that match that kicks you into touch uh you don't know when it's coming but you'll know that match and I remember that match for a long time so could you Tom see when you sort of like okay let's look at the first sort of the first half of your professional career were, were you the type of player that was the set could you settle very quickly could you could you go to an event and think you know what I'm confident I'll give it all I've got. Were you, were, were you like full of nerves or did you settle very quickly? Um, it It's different. I mean, you can go into some matches, you can feel really nervous. And then sometimes you can go into matches and you don't feel anything at all. Um, I think you need to feel a little bit of nerves to get yourself up for it. Um, I've gone into matches before where I felt nothing. And I'm thinking, well, I, I don't know. I just... Don't even, do I want to be here? I don't know what I'm doing. So I think you definitely need a bit of nerves, but I've always sort of settled pretty quickly, apart from on the the main match tables and in the main arenas, because we don't get to play on them very often. And I think when you do go out there, you've just got to try and you've got to try and get used to the table quickly. But it's very difficult when you're playing them players that have been on it so much. So it'd be nice if I could say I settle quickly, but do you know what? I don't really know. <laughs> I just don't know. Okay. Well, look, that's that's just focus. Just before we get, I want to get away. We're going to move on a wee bit here. But you know, look at the first ten years of your professional career. I mean, in in terms of what you expected to do and what you could do, do you feel that did, did, did you have doubts about yourself? Were you looking at yourself? Were you looking at your game and thinking, you know what, I should be doing better than this? Why, why aren't I? What, 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 what things can I do to improve my game? Tell me the sort of things you were thinking about. Um, well, as soon as I turned 18, 19, I started going out too much anyway. Um, started going out, enjoying myself a bit too much. Um, that, hasn't that hasn't changed. Uh, not really, no. But <laughs> yeah, so um, that was sort of the last from the age of say 18 to say 28 really 27 28 a, a big waste of time that i okay. really I wasted my time there um i think anyone would tell the same thing that all right i've not hit 
I've most likely not hit the potential that I could do. Yep. But I'm trying to get there. But like I said, I've wasted sort of maybe eight, nine years there. So trying to get that okay. back is really tough. So, so discipline, yeah. discipline, focus, concentration, things. All right, let's jump forward then. Let's go forward the last 10 years. All right. Let's let's go to that place. Let's let's look at your your focus then in terms of what you expect to do, what you expected to do. Let's just go back ten years between now and say two thousand and ten. Um. Well, that's sort of. Um, do you know what? I hope my wife ain't uh, listening to this. I think it was two thousand and ten. Yeah, she's on here. She's watching. I can see her right now. <laughs> uh, trust me, she's most like busy with Michael from DPD. He's around. Uh, <laughs> but, um, I think it was 2010 when I met her, and it's sort of sort of settled a little bit since then. Um, she wouldn't tell you that, but the first sort of six months when we met, I was still going out six nights a week, and uh, it was yeah. just getting a bit too much. But then once that all died down a little bit, and sort of settled a bit more and i can sort of i can say that i'm concentrating on my career a little bit more now as well whereas before i wasn't really concentrating on it you, a month went by a year went by and it was i look back at it and think what was i doing but i can definitely say now now i'm definitely concentrating more on my career now and i just wish i'd have done it sooner well that's fine you know and that's okay too because you know you, you obviously got your highest ranking position at the moment was 21 okay so yeah. you're, you're, not, you're you're okay you could say you're not really that far off your your highest position in the top 32 but uh if, if you kind of reflect on when you were 21 in the world which is you know tom that can change at any time over just a couple of tournaments but the thing is i mean did you and by the way i'm only going back in the last sort of maybe perhaps maybe eight years do you feel as if you should have got in the top 16 uh, uh, or didn't work hard enough? No, it was pretty tough, to be fair. Um, I, was, I think I was about 21. Yeah, I was 21 in the world at the time. Uh, I was on holiday with my wife. I think we was in, I think we was in Egypt. And uh, I rang home a couple of times just, just to say, hello, how's everybody doing? And uh, my sister answered the phone. And I thought there was something going on. There was something wrong. And my sister lives in Spain, so for my sister to answer the house phone, I thought, what's going on here? And uh, my sister ended up telling me that my dad had a stroke. Okay. So, uh, and I said, well, I was going to come home. And we only had, I think, one day left. So, obviously, I've, I've come back and my dad had a stroke. And uh, then I think it was two weeks before that or two weeks after that, my mum had got diagnosed with breast cancer as well. Mm -hmm. So... Um, that hit me quite hard um but then i went that's when the snooker still tried to carry on but my, my mind wasn't there my head wasn't on the job and i went from 21 in the world to i think i went from 21 to 63 in one and a half seasons okay and uh, i nearly fell off the tour yeah. um if i'd have been 65 i'd fell off the tour uh -huh. and um do you know what the same person marcus campbell was on the tour a good friend of mine as well up in scotland i was 21 i think he was 23 and i think it was about two months after my dad had the stroke his dad had a stroke and uh we both went the same way we just it just dropped down the rankings he finished 65 and i finished 63 he fell off the tour i just stayed on and he couldn't get back on the tour and luckily enough i just managed to stay on and then i've got myself back to where i was back then so i feel like my game's in a good place and my head's in a good place now do you know that's tom i'll tell you what that's that's a massive thing by the way and for some of the young guys or the young professionals who are going to watch or watching this or going to watch this a bit later on that's a very very significant point you've just made there because it it proves that you deserve to be where you are on the tour because quite a quite a lot of the lads through uh, uh maybe perhaps even a family tragedy or or a illness in their lives 
uh, the, 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 we're, we're in that type of sport where it does have an effect on your ability or your performance, and you can drop down the rankings and come back up, up again. Because, look, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. We're all affected by our lives and our families and, and bereavement and problems and ill health. But, I mean, you, you've proved that it's happened time, time and time again, Tom. It's happened time and time again with many other professionals through illness or problems or, or, or whatever, have come back or come back and got themselves back to where they were before, you know, and that's why you are where you are, you know, in that respect. So it's a great, it's, a, it's, it's kind of like a really good good thing to look back on. And that there, so that perhaps even what you just said there, Tom, is, you know, talking about your, you know, your mum and dad that, and the, the you know, the, 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 the scares and that there, and then you bounce back again. I, I've got a feeling that perhaps made you stronger. Um, I don't know. Most likely did, yeah. Um, but at the time, obviously, you don't think about things like that. Um, but you just don't. You just don't think anything like that's going to happen. Um, but obviously, it does. It's it's life, um, and it can be cruel. But it's just the way you try and get over it and bounce back. Whereas I'm not I didn't bounce back quick enough, but at least I did bounce back. It might have took me a lot longer than other people, but it is difficult and you've got to be prepared that it's not going to be easy and you've got to try and work hard. Unfortunately, I'm lucky because I didn't work hard, <laughs> but I just tried well, to be harder. Not, than I. Well, you're not. I mean, uh, uh, don't keep bringing that up because I'll, I'll end up telling you what you really are, okay? So what we're going to do here... <laughs> I think a lot of people... <laughs> yeah. What we're going to do, and actually I've just had a message from somebody here. I'm not going to tell you who it is. I will do a bit later. But uh, I want to, uh, we're going to get on to some general stuff now. So let's talk about your weaknesses and your strengths. I've got a thing, you're a high scorer. You're, you, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you can hit big breaks. What are your, let's talk about your weaknesses and your strengths. What are they? I'm not telling you. I don't want anyone to know my weakness. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm gonna no, ask you a question. I'm going to take the piss out of you. Okay, yes. so you better you better get straight to the point. Every professional snooker player has a strong point and a weak point. Okay, you might yeah. be a great long ball putter. You might be a pain in the ass. Okay, you might be a, a very weak player when it comes to pressure. I don't know. You know what your strengths are and your weaknesses. C come on, spit it out. Uh, my strengths are, oh, I've got a great one. I can take my opponent out the night before and have a few drinks and still beat him the next day. That's a strength. I know that, but I didn't <laughs> want to bring that up. <laughs> but, um, no, my strengths obviously my break building. Um, when I do get in, I score quite heavy. Um, my weakness is it's not so much my safety play. It's more if things don't go my way. Um, I start to get angry with myself and as soon as I start doing that it's like a downward spiral and everybody knows that um, and that's something I've struggled over the years but I've started to see a sports psychologist about that now Good. so okay. I see uh, it's uh, Sabrina Francis that I see and she's helped me out and it's a massive difference to what I was but I'm not trying to put the opponents off some people might say, oh, they might see a match and I might start getting angry with myself. They might say I'm trying to put the opponent off. It's not like that at all. Um, they want me to get angry with myself because as soon as I do, I get worse and I get worse and then it's I just explode. So it's no good. Um, so that's definitely a massive weakness for me, which I've tried to do something about. Um, you can't just let it be a weakness. You've got to try and do something about it. Well, you know, the thing is, you're dealing with it, Tom. You know, like a lot of young guys who are just getting on the tour, I've seen their tempers, and it's it's a setback. You know, temperament is a is a massive, massive part of this game. It's being in control. It's be, being able to contain, contain yourself. You know, a lot, of, a lot of players express it on screen. You know, and, and as a tour professional for, for 20 years, I can see that. You know, I can see that, you know, very clearly. You can see it on the screen. You don't have to, you don't have to know you personally. You can see with a lot of players, you can see it very clearly. 
to their their behavior and their expressions on screen and that's okay because it's all there it's there with everybody you know but i think a lot of young guys that are coming a lot of the young guys getting on a tour i see this all the time and it's they've got massive of masses of ability and it's their temperament of their domain it's it's part of their whole personality and yeah. they need to deal with it and the only way to deal with it is accept it accept it and there's only one person can deal with it would you agree with that yeah and also there's there's people that try not to show the emotion but sometimes you might need to show the emotion just to get it out yeah there's no point bottling it all up because eventually you bottle it all up you might just just explode you might think i can't keep all this emotion anymore you might explode you look at somebody like stephen mcguire and mark allen mm -hmm. uh, if the youngsters want to see somebody that they go oh they're getting angry now and them two players you look at them they could miss a ball they could walk off they could punch a table walk off and you think oh, i've got them they come back to the table and then they clear up again Absolutely. so some trying to keep your emotions in is not a good thing because them two if they kept their emotions in Oh, they're just blowed they'll go off the handle i think you know so, mark and stevie i i know mark and stevie i met stevie a few times i know mark Allen, obviously being irish <laughs> but uh stevie uh yeah yeah stevie very very talented a lot he is i'm very fond of stevie actually and he knows this i'm very very fond of him he's a he's a great player lots of potential uh temperament yeah terrible terrible tortures himself but you know there's a lot of players that do torture themselves and and they express it on the table and i think it's you know just for the just for the young guys who are watching this at home uh it's, this is a big big problem massive massive problem and when i interview you know top players like tom here on the screen and they talk about their their, their issues with temper and uh, behavior on the table it's something that you can't deal with it's it, you know you can deal with it and only you can deal with it and sometimes taking a step back and maybe having a little smile rather than thumping your cue on the ground or banging your cue against the table sometimes a slight distraction or a diversion can can maybe help with things like that you know yeah, maybe, not, you know we're not all robots we can't all sort of throw ourselves as a robot absolutely so emotions and we deal with them our own way tom this is going so well we're running a wee bit behind my what i want to do with you because you're you know you're actually you're a little bit more charismatic and i thought you would be you know i'd met you a few times before and you were as dull as hell but you're actually coming over very well on the on the on the screen here i tried to be dull so you didn't speak ah <laughs> right listen let's talk in general again now we're going to get through a couple of wee things that people are asking here um uh how do you how do you prepare yourself for events you know in a tournament uh, do, do you do, do you hit yourself with a well, like, like a quite a vigorous practice routine a few days before i know you're lazy i know you're lazy and okay okay but how do you prepare yourself how do you get yourself ready ready to uh, get in there and win a competition i try and practice like quite heavy a week before um I mean, if I've got a tournament that's three weeks' time, oh, I'd, I must I end up having a week off um, because I just can't practice for three weeks before a tournament. Mm -hmm. I can go in and maybe do an hour, and that's about it. But what I try and do, I try and play a few people the week before and try and I give myself about a week to try and play properly and give a good practice sessions. And that's all I do, really, about a week before, just trying to hit the practice table as hard as I can. And do you use a do you have a routine that you can share with me or do you do you use a do you use a ball spotter? No, I've got a routine. I'd have one lineup. I go and sit on the sofa, watch Sky Sports News for about an hour, um, have a walk around, <laughs> get on my phone, go and do another lineup. Um, and that's bad. <laughs> but um no, I just go in and just do whatever I want to do in the day, really. If I if I fancy potting long balls, I'll do that. If I want to do a bit of safety shots i'll do that it's just you know what you're struggling with at the time um so i'll just practice on what i'm struggling with at the time how important tom how important is it just to help the young professionals out there and uh, some of the top amateurs how important is a routine how, how important is that i'm not into routines to be fair um <laughs> I, <laughs> You're giving yourself a routine. What's a routine for? Just to try and be like a robot. 
What's the point? Yeah. Yeah, come on, for Christ's sake, Tom, you're in the top 32. You have weaknesses, all right? If, 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 you're, if you're playing in competition and you feel that maybe uh, there's a few, you missed a few shots, there's no reason for it. You're trying to work out why you missed those shots. Do you work on those shots, you know, like some of the tactical guys, or do you just think, you know what, I don't need to do that? No, I don't work on them, to be fair. Um, because if you do, they can get into your head. Uh, you could miss, I don't know, you could miss a black off a spot from a, a a hard angle. Now, it's not an easy shot if it's a hard shot, any, like a hard angle. So you could go back into practice, you could play that 10 times, and you're not going to pot it every time anyway. So if you were to practice a ball that you've missed in a match, and you miss it a couple of times in practice, then a month down the line, all of a sudden that shot comes up again in a match. You're automatically going to be thinking, well, I've missed this. I've been practicing it. I've missed it in practice. So to get it out of your head, get over that shot, go and practice something else. Because you know, go. you get it again in a month's time, you're going to have forgot about the shot that you missed. Mm-hmm. Just get it out of your head. Don't go back to the table and keep practicing that shot because you're going to have it in your head. And you, you don't want anything in your head in this game. You know, I'll tell you what, that's, that's, that's a very fair point. A very, very fair point. But, you know, uh, a couple of lads uh, have helped over the last couple of years. He's come off the bloody screen now. He's come. Let's get you back on again. Oh, why, got you. why are you such a pain in the ass? Why couldn't you just be straightforward? You know? <laughs> the thing is, you know, if you if you start missing some long balls, you know, and off the break, you know, when your opponent lets you in and you miss that opening red, for example, and you... You, you say say you just missed too many of them. Are, are, are you conscious as a snooker, as a top snooker professional conscious of that? And does he work on that? Should he work on that? Yeah, you, you obviously, things like that where somebody breaks off and you've got that shot to nothing. They should be balls that you practice anyway. Um, but there's not many balls that you will miss where you think, oh, do you know what, I best go and practice that. Because you should be practicing them already. Um, that, like you say, with the long pots, you should practice your long game anyway. You should practice some um, shots and nothing where somebody's broke off and they've left you that one red sticking out. So they're the balls you should be playing all the time. Um, so really, it's if you miss a ball, you shouldn't be going back thinking, oh, I best practice them, because you should be playing them already. And if you're not playing them already, then there's something wrong. So it's... You've got to give yourself a routine where you just set the balls up on your own. Play a frame on your own, and you'll know the shots that you've got to be playing all the time. And like I said, I wouldn't go back to practice the balls that you've missed because you'll get it in your head. And it's not, you don't, like I said, you don't want anything in your head in this game. That sounds like pretty good advice, Terry. You know, right, I want a slight, di- slight diversion here. A little bit more exciting, Tom, okay? A little bit more exciting. Let's talk about. Cues, tips, and chalk. Okay, what kind of what kind of cue do you play with? Thought you said this was going to be exciting. This is this is easy. That's why it's exciting. <laughs> Virgil O'Brien on this one, he'd be thrilled. He'd be over oh, the moon. No, 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 no! Don't give me a headache. Come on. Yeah. I love Virgil the bits, but don't mention his name. I'm going to have to start drinking alcohol. Um. You got, what's your cue? Q is a John Paris Q I've had since I've been about 18. What is that? Uh, a John Paris Ultimate or hand or specific? It's just a John Paris special. Um, whereas John has actually made me an Ultimate, but I've tried it and I just can't get on with it. Because like I said, I've had this Q since I was 18 years old. So for me to try different Qs, which I have in the past, mm-hmm. I just can't get used to them. I've had the Q too long. So okay. I've got a Paris special Q. And um, I just use at the minute I've got an Elk Master tip on. Um, okay. Entry G3s, which I quite like, but the All last right. one I put on was a little bit too hard, so I just went back to an Elk Master. Okay. And um, I use the blue, is it Pyro Chalk? Um, like the tail. Oh, that's the one. Yeah. I think that's about the best one on the market. Have you tried the uh, Tom Chalks? Yeah, I've tried them. The only trouble is I, I feel like I miscue with them a little bit too much. 
um, it doesn't grip as much. So uh, the blue one, I think, grips the most. Uh, I think that's the best one out there. Why have you got this nickname, Model T? Oh, it was. Um, it's only recently that Michael Alt calls it me every now and again. It's uh, <laughs> and then Seymour seen it on Twitter and he thought, oh, I'll call him that. Um, I mean, it's obviously not from the good looks, is it? Uh, no, it's, <laughs> no. It's the first, the first Ford car that was made was the Model T Ford. So that's why. I get that. I get that. I get that. So that's why the nicknames come about. You know, you want to get something a bit more exciting than that, for Christ's sake. What's the matter with you? You know, well, as soon as you start making some exciting questions, I'll get a better nickname. Oh, don't you turn on me. <laughs> this is pretty good so far, just over an hour. And I'm just about nearly ready to wrap this up because I want to watch, I want to watch, uh, you know, I want to watch a good movie. I'm not going to watch this bigger, for Christ's sake. Right. Okay. Look, outside the sport. Okay. What's your buzz? What's your Fine. buzz? <laughs> what do you love to do? What you, I, I, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I don't know. You might love watching movies. You might need eating steak, playing Xbox. I don't know. Oh, Tell no. us what you like to do when you wind down. Uh, I'm not a computer fan. I'm not a computer fan. It's uh, I just don't. I just can't sit there long enough, and I just. There's something about it that people will hate me saying this, but I don't play computers because I'm an adult. Um, <laughs> I just, I just don't think it's right. But no. I play a lot of golf. Okay. I like getting out and playing golf. I'm not brilliant, but um, I like getting around the course and just having a, having a beer with the lads afterwards and just general, just general life really. Um, Used to love playing. Used to love playing football back in the day, but then I had a, an injury about four and a half years ago, five years ago now. And uh, I used to play on Saturdays, um, eleven aside. But then I got injured and thought, you know what, I can't do this anymore because I broke my wrist in the past. I broke big toe, little toe, and I thought, no, I've got to give up now. So no more football, but I'll, I'll still stick to playing golf and. Uh, Joined a little society that we all play, right? And um, yeah, just have a game of golf, have a beer with the lads, and to keep myself grounded. Well, I love I love golf. I give I give up golf for shooting, you know. In the end, but you know, my thing now is I mean, I just spend all my time now looking for women, which you know, <laughs> is okay, but because I'm always in heat, you know. But I'm working on that one. I'm kind of hoping when we get out of COVID. Things will get back on track, you know, and that's that's why I've got good friends on here because I've got, you know, I've got Chris Henry over in Belgium. Chris has promised me he's going to invite me over and we're going to go out and look for friends, new friends. You know, that's okay. That's, it's great. It's great. Something we can do when we get out of this. I don't know. Uh, we'll be gone. <laughs> right, okay. guys, we're just about to wrap this up, but just before we go, okay uh tom is involved he's getting involved with a charity run okay and this is uh tom this is a thousand k run all right and this is for young maya okay tell us about this because i'm going to share this on the on the snooker page tell us a little bit about this tom and how important it is all right so there's there's 10 of us doing this run it's a it's a thousand k but it's uh we're doing it in march um so it works out we're doing 100 k each and that works out about two miles a day but there's 10 of us that don't run so um it's going to be difficult and especially with myself doing it it's i'm going to be in isolation a lot of the time at snooker events and won't be allowed out the hotel so yes two miles a day doesn't sound a lot but once you you do two miles one day and then miss a day, you've got to double up the next. So it is a lot tougher than you think. But uh, the main reason we're doing it for is Maya's, um, I think she's nine now, and she's got severe, I think it's epilepsy, and she has seizures. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're just trying to raise awareness of it because she's the only one in the UK that has it. 
and um, the NHS won't support it, won't fund it. So we're having to spend two thousand pound a month just to get the medication in from uh, Holland. So we're trying to raise as much as we can for the family, so she has a better life, gets all the medication, and hopefully they can give her a few other little things as well that we can try and give her a, a good little childhood that everybody has. So that's the thing we're doing, and we just hope that we can raise enough money for the the family. That's a very, very important thing. You know, you know, it's things like this, Tom. We don't realise sometimes how lucky we are, you know, in life. And, you know, I, I, I we all feel very, very strongly when we, we, we hear things like this about young kids with illnesses, epilepsy, cancer, whatever, and the kind of things we can do for us. So, guys, what I've done is I've shared the link for this on my page. So if you want to click on the link that I've shared uh, on the page and donate, uh, go ahead and do it or take a look at it and see what we're doing. We, we really don't do enough of things like this, you know, and I remember one of the snooker events, uh, we raised some money for cancer research about three years ago, one of my very first proms. And, you know, it's, it's a great feeling doing something for charity. It, it sort of like kind of gives you something back. And Tom, it's nice of you actually to sort of contribute and to, to, to do this thing because you're obviously being a family man. I know you're a pain in the ass, but I mean you're 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 a good family man and you're thinking about you know you're thinking about these things as we all are, you know, as we all have a joke and a laugh, you know. But that's it. So just before we wrap it up here, Tom, I want to ask you one more question, okay? All right. I want to get you know, this is not tough. This is not tough, okay? Where are you going here, mate? Uh, do you want to get, can you get in that top 16? What do you need to do to get in that top 16? What do you need to do to win ranking events? And this is for everybody out there. What do you need to do to get yourself up there? I think I just need one breakthrough tournament. One breakthrough tournament, and I think I'll get the belief that I know I can do it. Um, I know I can do it, but deep down, do I know I can do it? I'm not sure. So it's just that one, one event. That's all I need, I think. Just one event, and I think I'll be there. And Tom, I hope you get there very soon, mate. And uh, I again, I want to thank you very much for coming on. This is a good little profile. It's went really quick, actually, Tom. You know, the uh, the shootout started, you know, and Williams is just in front of uh, the chair. Well, <laughs> I don't know why you want to watch it. You're not going to watch it. You I won't watch it. You're not going to watch it. But I know you no. can tell you're in the hotel room because you've obviously got the tournament starting tomorrow and uh, yeah. and what have you. But it's uh, I hope you've dealt with COVID. It's one of the questions came from somebody actually about COVID. Tom, can, can you just very quickly tell us uh, how, how, much of co how much COVID has had an effect on you personally in, in, in terms of competition tournaments? Um, in the summer, it was difficult um, because we didn't have any events on. Yeah. Um, but also in the summer, also at the same time, it was a little bit easier because we, we was all in the garden. We had nice weather, didn't we? Um, but in the winter, it's obviously this time around, it's been tough because my little one's not at school. My wife's working full time from home. So I'm having to try and homeschool, which mm -hmm. you just want to be a fly ball that me and the little one, it's, it's terrible. We argue like mad. So it, it is really, really difficult. And then. But with the tournaments on as well, it's it sort of helps out that I can be away and earn money at the same time. I mean, none of us have had it easy, but no. we've all we've all got it difficult. But we've all got to just get on with it, and it'll pass soon, hopefully. And that's it. So, guys, we're going to wrap this up now. A little bit of positivity from Tom and myself. There, we're all going to get through this. So we're all going to keep safe and act responsibly and uh, do what we have to do to get through all of this. Thanks very much again, Tom, for joining us. This has been a very good, very easy interview. Guys, next week we got Martin Gould on. You know, Martin. Be <laughs> we got Martin. It, it, you won't be able to shut him up. No, I can't, you can't shut Martin up. <laughs> I'll tell you what, you know, in all fairness, Tom, you put a pretty good performance on yourself, mate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 